Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Howard. I'm a legislative associate with the National Congress of American Indians. I wanted to thank you today for joining the uh, webinar on the proposed rules for the FDA Food Safety Modernization Act. Uh, NCAI has been working in coordination with the FDA to host this listening session. And um, we will also be taking questions at the end of the presentation. Um, but if during the presentation you have a question, you can submit it in the question box. And it will store those, and we can answer them at the end. And uh, also do any follow-up that is that might be necessary for that. Uh, due to time, I'm going to go ahead and transition it over to the Food and Drug Administration, our presenters today. Great. Uh, thank you, Brian. This is Joy Johansson at FDA, and I'm a consumer safety officer on the produce safety staff. And this is Eric Snellman. I'm a policy analyst, microbiologist on the produce safety staff also. I'm going to have Joy go over the, uh, the first of the rules that uh, we're most familiar with, produce safety rule, and then I'll be briefing the preventive controls rule. Great. So uh, we want to thank you all for taking time on this overview of the proposed produce safety and preventive control rule. And uh, in December 2010, Congress passed the Food Safety Modernization Act, which was signed by President Obama in January 2011. And this new law emphasized prevention in the food safety system. And it required FDA to write a number of new regulations related to food safety. So the two uh, regulations that you can see here with publication dates are the two that have published so far, uh, produce safety standards and preventive control for human food. And we hope to publish the other three regulations listed here, um, the foreign supplier verification program, preventive control for animal food, and accredited third party certification uh, in the near future. And we are having an issue with the slide. <laughs> but I, I can keep talking. Um, the new regulations confirm the industry's primary role in establishing food safety. Uh, the regulations are both risk-based and flexible. And the regulatory burden is commensurate with the level of risk. And uh, the new regulations also address small business issues, for example, they provide additional time for small farms and businesses to comply. And um, the regulations were developed with extensive input with other parts of government at the federal, state, and local levels, as well as with um, stakeholders. And for example, in 2010, FDA opened a docket for public comment. Uh, related to the produce school prior to beginning work on the produce safety regulations. And we received hundreds of comments in that docket that we used developing the proposed rule. Next slide, Brian. So first today we'll discuss the provisions of the proposed produce safety rule. Next slide, Brian. <laughs> okay. So Thanks. So uh, the proposed rule on produce follows three key principles. Um, it considers the risk posed by practices, commodities, and conditions associated with growing, harvesting, packing, and holding produce, as well as how produce will be used and consumed after it leaves the farm. So a regulation is science and risk-based. It focuses on identified routes of microbial contamination. The proposal does not apply to certain types of produce that are rarely consumed raw. An example of those is potatoes. And the rule also does not apply to produce destined for processing that includes a kill step. So that would, an example of that would be green bean sent for canning. The regulation is flexible in many ways. It provides additional time for small operations to comply. And it also provides variances and alternatives for some provisions, which I'll address in a few moments. 
Next slide, Brian. So the framework considers many factors, uh, the regulatory framework associated with produce farming. So these include the diversity uh, within the produce farming community, the broad range of crops and agricultural practices employed, uh, the fact that much of the produce farming community does not have a regulatory history of interaction with FDA, and that some on-farm routes of contamination occur in relatively controlled environments, such as indoor environments, um, or partially enclosed buildings, whereas others occur in an outdoor environment. So we are proposing an integrated approach that draws on our past experiences with other commodities, such as good manufacturing practices, the shell egg regulation, and juice and seafood habits. Uh, in some cases, standards are very similar to those contained in the food uh, GMP regulation, except where the routes of contamination are well understood and measures well established and generally applicable. So an example of that would be health and hygiene requirements. Whereas in other cases, uh, in the produce where we propose specific numerical standards against which the effectiveness of a farm's measures would be compared and actions taken to bring the operation into conformance with the standard as necessary. So an example of that would be agricultural water microbial standards. Next slide, Brian. So, so uh, in terms of coverage, the proposed produce rule would cover farms that grow, harvest, pack, or hold most produce in their raw or natural state. These produce items are referred to as raw agricultural commodities. The rule also covers farm portions of mixed type facilities. These are farms that are also engaged in activities outside the definition of farm uh, that require food facility registration. So an example would be an establishment that grows and harvests produce but also conducts activities such as processing fresh cut produce that requires the establishment to be registered. So in such a case, only the establishment's farm activities, such as growing, would be subject to proposed produce rule. Other activities may be subject to the preventive control proposed rule. Uh, the proposed produce rule would cover both domestic and imported produce and it would cover farms with an average annual value of food sold during the previous three-year period of more than $25,000. Farms below the monetary threshold would not be covered by the proposed rule. Okay, and in terms of what produce is covered, uh, produce would be defined as fruits and vegetables. It would include mushrooms, sprouts, herbs and tree nuts. It would not include grains and there are some additional limitations on cover produce which I'll go over in more detail. So the proposed rule includes a number of limitations on coverage and uh, some of these I mentioned a minute ago. Produce that is produced by an individual for personal consumption or produced for consumption on the farm or on another farm under the same ownership would not be covered. Uh, produce that is not a raw agricultural commodity would not be covered. And an example of that is fresh cut bag salad. Um, also excluded is produce that's rarely consumed raw, produce that would receive commercial processing um, to adequately reduce microorganisms with public health significance, farms with sales of less than $25,000 a year, and the proposal will also include a qualified exemption for farms with sales of less than $500,000 per year using a three-year year average to sales to qualified end users to make up the majority of sales. So, as I indicated, the proposed rule focuses on five primary identified routes of microbial contamination of produce. They are agricultural water, 
biological soil amendments of animal origin, worker health and hygiene, equipment, tools, buildings, and sanitation, uh, and domesticated and wild animals. And in addition, there are specific requirements for sprout and several other additional requirements related to growing, harvesting, packing, and holding. So I'll now go through the identified routes of microbial contamination and their related provisions in more detail. Um, I'll be summarizing some of the proposed requirements, but will not cover every one. So I encourage you to consult fact sheets on these routes of contamination that you can find at fda.gov slash FIDMA and the proposed regulation and the preamble of the regulation have the most detail if you're interested in more detail. So agricultural water used for produce production presents different microbial quality demands depending on its use. Water can be a carrier of many different microorganisms of public health concern. The proposed rule defines agricultural water as water used in covered activities um, covered by the rule, on produce covered by the rule, where it is intended to, or is likely to, contact covered produce, produce or food contact surfaces. So this water would include water used for growing, such as irrigation water, directly applied, water used for preparing crop sprays, and water used for growing sprouts. It would also include water used in harvesting, packing, and holding, including water used for washing, or cooling harvested produce and water use to prevent dehydration of produce. So some of the requirements related to water are all agricultural water must be safe and of adequate sanitary quality for its intended use. And at the beginning of the growing season, the agricultural water system under a farm control would have to be inspected to identify conditions reasonably likely to introduce pathogens to produce for food contact surfaces. And the system would have to be maintained to prevent it from becoming a source of contamination. And if the farm found problems, they would need to either treat the water or reinspect the system, make changes, and test the water. And the proposed rule also includes specific criteria for the quality of agricultural water used for certain purposes with proposed requirements for periodic analytical testing. And we propose standards for water that vary depending upon the risk posed by the use of the water. And a farm would be permitted to establish and use alternatives to the requirements established for testing water used in growing, um, as long as the farm had adequate scientific data to support the conclusion that the alternative would provide the same level of public health protection as the standard in the rule. Next slide, please. So I'll go into a bit more detail on the agricultural water requirements. And um, the rule includes provisions requiring periodic analytical testing of water with exemptions provided for use of public water supplies under certain specified conditions for treated water. And the rule requires certain actions be taken when water does not meet the quality standard. So more specifically, a uh, farm would be required to test water using an appropriate analytical method when the water is used for sprout irrigation water. Um, or in a manner that directly contacts covered produce during or after harvest, um, including as ice, and for water used to make a treated agricultural tea, um, water used to contact food contact surfaces, or water used for hand washing during or after harvest. So for all those uses I just mentioned, um, the farm would need to test the water, and if there's any detectable generic E. coli in 100 milliliters of water, then they would need to immediately stop using that source of water or its distribution system for those uses and take actions including making changes to their system uh, and retesting or treating that water. And then for water use during growing activities, 
using a direct application method. The uh, farms would still have to test the water, but the microbial standard would be different. It would be if the farm found more than 235 uh, CSU per generic of uh, generic E. coli per 100 milliliters for a single sample, then they would need to immediately discontinue use of that source of water and for its distribution system for those uses and take specified follow-up actions. So those actions would include making changes to the system and retesting or treating the water. So the next uh, route of contamination uh, pertains to soil amendments. So soil amendments are any chemical, biological, or physical material added to soil to improve the chemical or physical condition of the soil in relation to plant growth or to improve the capacity of the soil to hold water. So biological soil amendments of animal origin are soil amendments that consist in whole or in part of materials of animal origin, such as manure or non-fecal animal byproducts or table waste. So the produce rule focuses on these biological soil amendments of animal origin because of their potential to contaminate produce with pathogens of public health concern. So related requirements include definitions for determining whether the soil amendment is treated or untreated, and for their handling, conveying, and storage. Um, the rule would establish requirements for treating these soil amendments um, with scientifically valid, controlled physical or chemical processes or composting processes that meet or support these specific microbial standards. And <coughs> If a farm wanted to use untreated soil amendments, they could do so, but they would have a longer application interval between the application of the soil amendment and harvest of the produce, and they would have more limitations on how they applied it. They couldn't apply it in a way that the, um, the produce would later contact it. So, and the rule also establishes application requirements um, related to soil amendments. And this is another area in which the rule allows for alternatives um, specifically to be composting treatment processes and minimal interval between application and harvest. Um, a farm could use a different um, approach provided that they had adequate scientific information that the alternative would provide the same level of public health protection that would not increase the likelihood that covered produce would be adulterated. So I'll go into a little more detail on soil amendments. Uh, the underlying framework for the provisions related to soil amendments is that stricter control should be required for a practice that is more likely to result in the amendment contacting covered produce than for one that is less likely to result in contract, contact. So the rule includes multiple acceptable options for treatment of soil amendments and the standards against it would be validated. And I, rec I recommend um, on this topic looking at the fact sheets online that have a lot more detail on these options. Next slide. So another route of contamination is um, that pathogens may be transmitted from people to food, especially through the fecal oral route. And so requirements related to worker health and hygiene include that personnel who handle covered produce or supervise such personnel must receive training, including specified topics. Uh, another requirement is that measures to prevent contamination of covered produce and food contact surfaces from any person with an applicable health condition um, are included in the rule. So those conditions would include um, a communicable illness, infection, open lesion, vomiting, or diarrhea, 
Um, the rule requires provision of toilet and hand washing facilities to personnel. And personnel who work in operations in which produce or food contact surfaces are at risk of contamination would be required to use hygienic practices to protect against contamination of the produce. So those practices include um, avoiding contact with animals other than working animals and minimizing contact with covered produce when in direct contact with working animals, washing hands thoroughly before or after certain activities, and maintaining gloves appropriately if gloves are used. But the rule would not require that gloves be used. Okay, the last route of contamination, uh, sorry, the second to last route, the fourth one, uh, would be equipment, tools, building, and sanitation. So related requirements include that equipment and tools must be of adequate design, construction, and workmanship to enable them to be adequately cleaned and properly maintained. Uh, food contact surfaces of equipment and tools must be inspected, maintained, cleaned, and sanitized as frequently as necessary to protect against contamination. Uh, buildings would be required to be suitable in size, construction, and design to facilitate maintenance and sanitary operations for covered activities to reduce potential for contamination. Buildings would be required to be constructed in a way that floors, walls, ceilings, and pipes could be adequately cleaned and kept in good repair, and that strip or condensate would not contaminate covered produce or food contact surfaces. And buildings would be required to have readily accessible toilets and hand washing facilities. So domesticated and wild animals are another possible route of contamination because pathogens can be introduced into fruit and vegetable production systems through animal feces. The proposed rule balances the need to prevent contamination with the need to be practical and flexible with the diversity of produce operations and to ensure that prevention measures are in harmony with resource and wildlife conservation efforts whenever possible. The proposed produce rule is consistent with sustainable conservation practices. It does not require animals to be harmed, farms to be fenced, uh, animal habitats to be destroyed or farm borders to be cleared. So these requirements in this section would only apply when there's a reasonable probability that animals will contaminate covered produce. For example, when covered produce grows completely underground, we expect that there would not be a reasonable probability of contamination by animals that may graze on or encroach into the field. So requirements on this topic include that if animals are allowed to graze or are used as working animals in fields where produce is grown and there is a reasonable probability that the animals would contaminate produce, the farm would be required to wait an adequate amount of time between grazing and harvest in any growing area to ensure the safety of the harvested crop. And if working animals are used, in a growing area where a crop has been planted, the farm would need to implement measures to prevent the introduction of hazards on the cover produce from the animals. And if there is reasonable probability that animal intrusion would contaminate cover produce, the farm would need to monitor for evidence of animal intrusion immediately before harvest and as needed during the growing season. And the grower would need to not harvest visibly contaminated produce. <coughs> so sprouts have a specific section in the proposed produce rule. The sprout growers would need to follow the, the rest of the requirements in the rule in addition to this section. Um, sprouts present a unique risk because the conditions such as a warm, moist environment that are used to produce sprouts are also ideal for the growth of pathogens. So these requirements include that sprout growing 
harvesting, packing, and holding would need to be done in the fully enclosed building. Um, the rule would require treating seeds used for sprouting in a valid method right before sprouting to reduce microorganisms of public health significance. The rule would require testing the spent irrigation water from each production batch of sprouts or testing the sprouts themselves for certain pathogens. And it would require monitoring the growing, harvesting, packing, and holding environment for either Listeria species or Listeria monocytogeny. So the rule includes a few additional requirements um, for operation handling both covered and excluded produce. If the excluded produce is not handled in accordance with the rule, uh, the, the firm would need to separate the two types of produce and clean and sanitize as necessary food contact surfaces used on the produce excluded from the rule before those surfaces come into contact with produce covered by the rule. And also, the rule would require not distributing covered produce into commerce that drops to the ground before harvest unless it is exempt because it receives commercial processing uh, to reduce the presence of microorganisms of public health significance. And in addition, food packing materials would have to be adequate for their intended use. They would need to be cleanable or designed for single use and unlikely to support growth or transfer of bacteria. So one way the proposed produce rule is flexible is that it permits alternatives to certain requirements. It would provide that farms may establish alternatives to certain requirements related to water and biological soil amendments of animal origin, as mentioned earlier, if the alternative is scientifically established to provide the same amount of protection as the requirement in the proposed rule without increasing the risk of adulteration. Next. And the proposed rule also is flexible in that the rule would allow a U.S. state or foreign country to request a variance from some or all provisions of the rule. Uh, they would need to determine that it is necessary in light of their local growing conditions. And practices under the proposed variance would need to provide the same level of public health protection as the requirements of the proposed rule without increasing the risk of adulteration. Next. And the proposal would require certain records, for example, to document that certain of the standards are being met. And one example of this is agricultural water testing results. However, the rule would not require the duplication of records that are already being kept for other purposes. And FDA has issued a draft qualitative assessment of risk as part of the rule it's referenced to in the uh, online and the Federal Register version of the rule. And this assessment provides a scientific evaluation of potential adverse health effects resulting from human exposure to hazards and produce with a focus on public health risk associated with on-farm microbial contamination of produce. And we are seeking comments on this assessment of risk, which can be submitted along with comments on the proposed protocol. Next. So compliance dates for the produce safety rule are staggered based on farm size. And FDA is proposing 60 days after the issuance of the final rule as the effective date for the rule. But farms would not need to meet the requirements on that date. Um, so we're requiring staggered compliance dates, proposing those dates for farms that would be covered based on size. So under this rule, very small farms have an average annual value of food sold of more than $25,000 per year and no more than $250,000 a year. So these farms 
would have four years after the effective date to comply. And for some water requirements, they would have six years to comply. Next. So small farms have an average annual value of food sold of no more than $250,000 from here and no more than $500,000 a year. So those farms would have three years after the effective date to comply. For some water requirements, they would have five years to comply. And all other covered farms that do not meet the definition of very small or small would have two years after the effective date to comply. Whereas for some water requirements, they would have four years to comply. So that is the last slide on the produce rule. And I'm going to turn it over to Eric now to quickly cover the preventive control rule. Sure. Hey everyone, uh, this is Eric Snellman. Uh, before we get started with the uh, preventative culture of human food, uh, you probably should take a quick admin break and I just need to remind everybody or tell everybody that since the docket is open for comment on the rule and rule is published, that we need to keep records of the, um, every outreach engagement that we participate in. So we're going to make a, a brief uh, record to enter in the docket for the rules. Um, and um, the background information is simply the, the organization that we're speaking to. And the web administrators to give us the numbers of folks on the line that would help us um, fill out some additional information to say how many folks we reach today. So um, I'm going to give a brief overview of the uh, preventative control for human food uh, regulation that published uh, the same time as the produce rule. It has um, some key principles that I'll discuss in this first slide. Uh, first of all, it confirms the industry's primary role on food safety. That is, the uh, industry itself will be determining the hazards in the production of the foods that they produce. And it's, uh, it's a preventive control regulation. So it's designed very much like the produce rule wants to identify the hazards and then put in place preventive controls that address and control the hazards to minimize risk um, for adverse health reactions. It is risk-based, and we say that because the nature and extent of the preventive control required to control the hazards uh, would depend on which, if any, of the hazards are likely to exist in that sort of food item. Next slide. The requirements can be summarized in uh, two broad statements. First of all, there's a hazard analysis and risk-based preventative controls uh, approach to this rule. Each facility will be required to implement a written food safety plan, and part of that food safety plan would be a hazard analysis of the food that's produced by that facility. And the second part of the rule uh, is essentially the update of the good uh, manufacturing practices uh, regulation 110. Next Who is covered by the rule? Any facility that manufactures, processes, packs, or holds human foods would be covered by this rule. And in general, that, that's going to apply to facilities that are required to register with the FDA under uh, Section 415 of the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act. This rule also applies, like the produce rule, to domestic and imported food. And we also have I suppose with some exceptions and modified requirements are, are proposed for this rule. Next slide. So this slide is just a brief uh, overview of hazard analysis. It's very similar to HACCP. If you're familiar with seafood HACCP or juice HACCP, uh, it starts with a hazard analysis of the food that you produce in your facility. Uh, you would then uh, develop a series of preventive controls to reduce the likelihood of those hazards causing adverse uh, health reactions. Um, development of monitoring procedures is the next step to monitor the preventive controls that you have in place to make sure that they're they're working as designed. If you were to see a lapse 
allergies that it contains. Data patient controls are proposed in this rule, and that includes things like the cleanliness of food contact surfaces, prevention, prevention of cross-contamination, cross-contact, etc. And we also are proposing a recall plan to develop a pilot facility to be in compliance with this rule. Next slide. So facilities such as warehouses um, that only store packaged foods that are not exposed to the environment would be exempt from the preventive control for human food rule. However, certain foods would not be exempt, and those would be um, foods for which refrigeration is required for safety to adequately control the hazards within that food. Um, so those controls we're proposing uh, will be monitored and verification and records essentially filling out the, the, the circle that I briefed uh, a couple slides ago. So uh, again, facilities that are warehouses in general would not be uh, covered by the rule with the exception of those that are warehouses with temperature controls to control that, that are designed to control the hazards in place. Next one. Also exempt, we're proposing an exempt would be certain storage facilities, such as grain elevators and, and warehouse uh, that, that store only raw agricultural commodities other than fresh fruits and vegetables intended, and they must be intended for further distribution of processing. They, they would be exempt from the hazard analysis and risk-based uh, preventive controls pieces of the rule. And they would um, also be exempt with respect to the uh, GMP um, portion of the rule. And this that slide transitions quite nicely into the next one. So facilities that are warehouses that, that store raw agricultural commodities or rats, as we use the term in the produce rule, those are fruits and vegetables, those are not exempt from the hazard analysis and risk-based preventative control pieces of this rule. However, they are exempt, excuse me, with respect to the EMP uh, section of the rule. This is essentially um, in existence now, which is to say that there is a current exemption for storage of, um, of racks from GMPs, and it's, uh, I believe it's uh, 110.119 is the exemption where that's spelled out in the GMPs. Next slide. So there are farm-related exemptions here, and I think based on Joy's presentation, you can see why that we are proposing the exemption. And essentially, that would be the activities within the definition of farm, the farm activities that uh, Joy mentioned in the briefing. And the reason for that exemption, of course, is that so there are other certain low-risk manufacturing, processing, packing, and holding activities conducted by very small businesses uh, on farms for specific foods. An example of that might be the production of jams and jellies, for example. Next date, uh, slide. The effective compliance date, um, the effective date of this rule is actually 60 days after the final rule is published in the Federal Register. And um, the effective dates are, I'm sorry, the compliance dates of this rule are tied to definitions of small business and very small businesses. So we're proposing that a small business uh, be a business that employs fewer than 500 per person. If that were the case, then the compliance date for such a business would be two years after the publication. Why? So for very small business, we've asked for public comment on how best to define that. So we have uh, three alternatives mentioned in the rule that are discussed in the first bullet. A very small business is a business having less than 250,000, or alternately, we're asking for comment whether the public thinks it would be better served if it were less than 500,000 or less than 1 million in total annual food sales. <coughs> Depending on how that very small business is defined in the final rule, uh, that small business, very small business, would have three years to 
buy after publication. And essentially, the other businesses that are left are could be uh, assumed to be large businesses outside the other definitions would be would have um, one year after publication of the final rule to respond. Next slide. So like the produce rule, there's a draft quantitative uh, qualitative assessment of risk uh, associated with this rule that addresses activities outside the farm definition but those activities that may be co-located on the farm. Uh, we're asking for comments. I believe this is a separate docket. Um, we're asking comments on, on that risk assessment separately so that we can consider them to refine um, the, the risk assessment. Next slide. So in general, this applies to both rules. Um, we just want to point out how to make a comment on the proposed rule. And I, I just would like to say in general that we're trying to get both rules correct. We want to do what's best in the public interest. And if you uh, have a comment on any of the provisions, which is our approach, our regulatory approach to either rule in general, then we, um, we really want you to make a comment in, um, on the rules. And when you make comments, if, for example, you would I'm just going to throw this out here. You would want something um, to be exempt from the produce rule. If you have a series of steps on how you harvest that produce commodity, how you store it, etc., that you believe limits the uh, the exposure or the, the hazard to microbial contamination, for example, then please please be as specific as you can in your comments so we can evaluate them. We, um, we are also taking a number of questions that we received from the public from various venues, include live questions, and we've also been using those questions to inform our rulemaking, and those themselves are, are types of comments that we were considering. Um, so specifically how to make comments, you can use this website, uh, www.regulations.gov. There's a link to the rules on our website, either at mba.gov or slash not Comments are due now for um, this slide is um, a couple weeks old because we've extended the comment period. Uh, the comments are now due September 19th, I believe, is the date. So we had 120 day extension. So um, next slide. So this, this slide just covers the over the, the rulemaking process in general. Um, the FDA proposes the rule and requests comments, and the big yellow arrow says that's where we are. <laughs> so we've got, we've got uh, we're not to step two, we're generating uh, public comments. We need to consider the coming comments, and then we have a period of time before the FDA has to issue a final rule. Next slide. So we do a number of outreach venues. This one, uh, for example, is a form of outreach. We can always do a webinar. Uh, we're often invited for public meetings. We've given a number of public meetings, we do listening sessions. Um, there are contact information on the dockets for some uh, for the rules. You feel free to click um, on those individuals, give them a phone call, send them an email. Those will be passed to the staff, and we'll try to answer them the best that we can. Um, so to um, we encourage the public to request um, outreach events from us, and we try to fulfill those responsibilities as best we can. Next slide. So we are developing or working with a number of um, technical assistance entities. We have three alliances. The first is the Police Safety Alliance, which is in uh, um, right out of Cornell, and that's a public. Uh, private entity established by the FDA, University of Cornell, and the USDA. Uh, they're developing curriculum that primarily targets small farmers to, to, to help them bring it to um, their operations into compliance with the rule, talk about gaps with agricultural practices, um, bring in the concepts of the rule that we've discussed today about preventive controls. There's also a preventive controls alliance and a crop safety alliance. We have are in the midst have already begun developing document 
guidance document to support the rules. Uh, there's a contractor that we is working on developing technical assistance, uh, technical information document that the FDA will use to uh, develop into guidance directly. And uh, we have a national technical assistance network as the folks that we can reach out to to uh, provide technical assistance, extension agents, USDA, things like that. Folks that will food safety partners that we're working with across the country to provide us assistance as needed. And uh, next slide. So here's our website again. Description feature if you want to update an email to you and you can send some questions to that general email inbox to us if you'd like. And I think that's it. Joy and I would be happy to entertain any questions that you have. Uh, Brian, do you want to collect those or organize those? Yes. Um, thank you for the presentation. We've already had um, a couple of questions that were submitted uh, through the questions pane. But uh, just to remind everyone, if you do have a question, you can either type it in the question box or you can use the uh, raise the hand option and that will signal, signal me to unmute your line. Uh, so the first question that we got was in regard to tribal consultation and if the FDA has any plans of conducting such consultations and uh, if so, how would they, how would they be doing it? Uh, we brought uh, the intention of um, our consultation requirements and our, our outreach um, initiatives to, um, to outreach the tribal nations to the attention of the uh, Office of Food and Veterinary Medicine. And uh, we are working on a strategy right now to, um, to provide that information and to provide more assistance um, to your members. Um, all I can say right now, we are working on it. Okay, is there any uh, specific time frame to when Chad should be expecting some sort of release of that? Um, I don't have a time frame right now, I'm sorry to say, but I will get back to the organization as soon as we um, have formulated a plan. I can tell you that we are actively engaged in in that process now. Alright, our next question uh, was about will the same rules apply to growing and handling microgreens that apply to sprouts? Uh, the short answer is no, that microgreens don't meet the definition of sprouts and so they would fall under the produce rule in general but not the um, subject to the sprout subpart. This is Eric. I could also add that we're trying to um, take some questions that we receive from the public and sort of generalize them so they're applicable to as many people as possible. And this is one area that has been asked, um, I'm going to say about a half a dozen times. So we are actually working on um, a question and answer, one or one more questions and answers, addressing this area. And then uh, It'd be great if you could uh, visit the FISMA website weekly or at least monthly to check for updates. We also have a series of questions that we're working through right now to, uh, to discuss how an infection may occur and, and general uh, Q's and A's, uh, if you will, that address those inspection and compliance and enforcement provisions of the rule, just of a general nature. And those were written and posted and now soon to be posted based on public input. So uh, just to reiterate, we have gotten a number of questions on this topic. We are working on a, on a Q&A for this topic, and we hope to post it on the FISMA website soon. Great, thanks. And um, I see that we have a question from Patty Martinson. I'm unmuting your line, so go ahead and speak. Thank you. My question is, with so many uh, grassroots organizations and uh, native and rural communities that have um, not only small or very small farms but have food production facilities in the same area are um, what are the what are going to be the regulations
and it is already regulated by SSIS, FDA, USDA, our environment department, and several others. But the produce that we grow in our garden, uh, hopefully under just GAP standards, will be accessible to that production. And I can't define that by what I'm looking at. Thank you. Not dollars, <laughs> in other words. Um, we're we're having a hard time wrestling with that uh, question. So you're saying that there's there's other there's audits going on at the facility that um, USDA auditors, for example, as we understand, audit against um, requirements that they are provided uh, by either an industry group and in a marketing agreement or some other group. So we understand their presence for quality issues and buyer issues, there could be a third party audit. Um, certainly, I heard you say that there are many farms that have low production of uh, fruits and vegetables on their farm. I've, so there's a $25,000 exemption that Joy, less than $25,000 exemption that Joy had briefed on with the um, produce rule. I would like to make sure that everybody understands that that is for food and that it is for sale of food. Food in this case is defined by the Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act in Section 201F. So that includes many more items than just produce grown on the farm. So if your total food sales of all food to include feed for animals, um, would exceed 25,000 and, and barring no other exemption, and there are several other exemptions in the produce rule, and note that would be um, produce that would be covered by a rule, but there are still plenty of other exemptions. For example, if a small farm were set up as a community supported agricultural farm or a member of a community supported agricultural farm, and the majority of their sales is to um, qualified end users, and that means direct to the public, to retail establishments or restaurants. If the majority of the food is sold to them, then you would be exempt from most of the provisions of the produce rule, with the exception of a few labeling provisions about where the food was grown and on what farm. So I'm hoping that addresses at least some of your concerns. But it does. I see that there is a mixed-use facility, but it doesn't completely. So we'll just try and deal with that in the comments. But thank you very much for trying to clear that up. Yeah, well, we can speak to that really quickly. Um, the mixed farm facility, so the produce rule would be covered by the farm activities of any mixed farm. And if the farm performed an activity that would uh, cause it to register, under the uh, well, positive register under the Bioterrorism Act, the, the act that I showed on the slide, then um, again, if you could still have exemptions from being covered under the preventive control rules, but the produce rule would all, only cover those farming activities um, and not not the mixed portion activities produced on that farm. If that, if that helps. Okay. Thanks. All right. Thank you, Patty. And again, if you have any uh, questions, you can use the raise the hand option, which uh, will signal me to unmute your line, or you can uh, type it in the questions box. Uh, right now, we'll go to another question that was submitted in the questions box. Um, there was a question about temporary vendors. Uh, vendors that are set up at events such as powwows or farmers markets, or vendors that sell in buildings that do not have permanent establishment. Um, the question was, would these permit holders have to comply? Uh, with the farmers market, that would usually be direct to consumer sales. So if a farmer had more than half of their products sold directly to consumers, uh, at a farmer's market, then they would 
be exempt from the code rule. Does that answer the question? All right, so we'll go ahead and move on to the next question that was submitted. Um, the question was, are there agencies that are offering ready, readiness training, uh, particularly for small businesses and farms? Uh, yes, the FDA and USDA are working together with Cornell University as their extension through the Produce Safety Alliance on uh, training and education to uh, help growers, especially small growers, be prepared to meet the requirements of this rule. All right, thank you. And uh, I don't see any other questions that are being submitted. Uh, so I just wanted to remind people that if you do have a question, you can use the raise the hand option, which will signal me to unmute your line. Or um, if you have any other questions, uh, you can submit them uh, to myself afterwards, and I can also share that and forward it on to the presenters and um, get it to the appropriate people to answer. Okay, Brian, before we leave, we can wait a couple more minutes for a couple of questions. Um, but um, I want to admit now that I misspoke about the um, time frame for the, um, the deadline for comments. I said September 19th, it's September 16th, it appears at our website. So I'm sorry to say you have three less days. Um, I could also kind of re-explore the outreach to the tribal nations um, question a little bit more. Um, FDA follows the uh, Health and Human Services consultation policy and uh, is exploring an FDA protocol for outreach. And while we don't have a time frame now, we certainly provide an opportunity for the tribes to participate in this process. Mary Hitch of the Office of uh, Health and Constituent Affairs is coordinating an agency-wide process, and I will defer questions to Mary concerning the time frame. But again, I can coordinate the answer back um, to this organization myself, too. So um, are there any other questions? I do not see any other questions that have been submitted at this time. All right, well, if there's no other questions, Joy and I want to thank you for inviting us to um, give the webinar and help you understand a little bit more about FISMA. We hope that the presentations were helpful, but we understand um, that they, they were at a very high level. And um, certainly we invite you to dive uh, deeper into both rules, um, either submit comments individually or collectively as you see, see fit for the, um, the common area, the subject matter that you wish to comment upon. And we're really looking forward to um, reading those comments and um, considering um, them as we uh, in our, informing our rulemaking. So thanks for the opportunity to speak with you, and uh, we'll hear from you later. All right, thank you. And uh, just uh, some closing uh, remarks. Uh, this webinar was recorded, so we will post it online, and I'll share that with the attendees and also those that register that weren't able to attend today. But uh, again, if you have any follow-up questions, you can direct them to me. Again, my name is Brian Howard. I'm a legislative associate with MCAI, and uh, my email I just uh, included to um, in the chat box, so everyone should have received it. So thanks again, and uh, if there's nothing else, we'll go ahead and conclude. Thanks, Brian. Bye-bye.